Well, hello again. I have to apologize. My big computer is still sick, so I had to do this program on my laptop, and you will not see a floating head again. Uh, you may remember that we were studying the life of the patriarch Jacob a few weeks ago when we interrupted that study to look at the New Testament and Jesus' parables about the sower and the harvest. We're now going to return to the book of Genesis and resume our study of Jacob. When we last saw him, here in this panel by Lorenzo Ghiberti, he was on the lamb, fleeing from the wrath of his brother Esau after he had cheated him out of the blessing that normally goes to the firstborn by deceiving their father Isaac with the help of his mother Rebekah. Jacob heads to Haran, where Rebekah is from, in order to find a wife from amongst her own people. On his way, he has a dream and sees the angels of God ascending and descending a staircase. This is how William Blake, better known for his poetry, but also an accomplished artist, this is how he conceived of the dream. Jacob sees the Lord at the top of the stairs and the Lord makes him the same promise he made to Abraham and Isaac before him, that he will be with him, that his descendants will be as numerous as the stars, and that he will inherit the promised land. Jacob is suitably impressed, but makes a curious vow to the Lord upon awakening. He makes an altar. He names this special place Bethel, the house of God. But basically, it's a quid pro quo. If you, God, sorry, if you, God, will be with me and keep me safe on this journey, if you'll feed me and clothe me and bring me back to my home safely, then you, the Lord, will be my God. And this stone I have set up as an altar will be God's house. And of everything that you give me, I will give you a tenth in return. Jacob always hedges his bets when he's not downright cheating someone out of something in order that he makes sure he gets his way in the end. Not for nothing is he called Jacob the deceiver. He arrives in Haran and falls in love with Rachel, who is the daughter of Laban, Rebekah's brother, when he sees her drawing water at the well. This is how Gustave Doré, the famous engraver and printmaker, illustrated the scene for the 1866 Bible. He asks for her hand in marriage and Laban agrees, on condition that Jacob work for him for seven years. Seven years pass and Jacob is on the verge of marrying Rachel, but on the wedding night, when the marriage was to be consummated, Laban surreptitiously arranges for his elder daughter Leah to be the one who sleeps with Jacob and she effectively becomes his wife. Jacob must work for Laban for another seven years before he can gain the hand of Rachel. And he is so in love with her that he does just that. At the end of his long servitude to Laban, during which he gained nothing, Jacob finally manages to outwit him, and by a very complicated scheme, accumulates a vast number of sheep and goats he also becomes a father of a considerable number of children. At long last, Jacob receives a vision from the Lord, instructing him that the time has come to return to his homeland. He knows that Laban will try to prevent him from going, so he and his family depart without telling him and head back toward Canaan. And this is where our reading for today picks up the story. Jacob has more than a little reason to be uncertain of the kind of reception he might receive when he arrives back home and has to face the brother he cheated out of his inheritance. So he sends a messenger ahead to his brother Esau with these instructions. This is what you are to say to my lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says, I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, male and female servants. Now I am sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. Well, you can imagine Jacob's reaction when his messenger brings back word that Esau is coming out to meet him. 
together with 400 men. He's terrified and certain that Esau is coming with an army ready to kill him. So he divides all the people who are with him, as well as all the flocks and herds, into two groups, thinking that if Esau attacks one group, at least the other will be spared. And for the first time since he left Bethel, where he saw the angels on the ladder at least 20 years before, we hear Jacob praying to the Lord and reminding him of the promise he made to keep him safe. To further cover his bets and sweeten the deal with Esau, he also sends ahead a number of goats, camels, sheep, and cattle in the care of a servant, who is to tell Esau that this is a gift from his brother Jacob. And that brings us to this famous scene in Genesis 32. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. It's such a fascinating, mysterious passage. At first, we're told that Jacob is encountering a man, but by the end, we know that in some way, Jacob has wrestled with God in human or angelic form. Jacob, in some way, has come up against an adversary with whom, perhaps unwittingly, he has been wrestling all along. He has been trying to gain a blessing ever since he tricked Esau out of his birthright by selling him a bowl of lentil stew, or as it used to be called, a mess of pottage. In fact, he has been trying to get that blessing from the time he and Esau were born and he came out grabbing Esau's heel, trying to get out of Rebekah's womb first, hence the name Jacob in Hebrew, he who grabs the heel, he who would supplant a deceiver. But real blessing, ultimately, can only come from God. And you can't steal it from him, cheat him out of it, and you can't cut a deal with him. He either gives it or he doesn't. But you have to admire Jacob's tenacity. He is willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with God all night long and vows that he will not let him go until he has been given this supreme benediction. To which God replies, what is your name? So now it becomes a question of identity. Who are you? Who is it that has been wrestling with me all night long? In other words, if God chooses to bless, it will involve affirming one's identity, one's very being in his sight. And Jacob has to say his name. He must acknowledge who he has been since the very beginning, one who deceives. But God considers that Jacob has at last outgrown that name. He has finally realized that his real battle has been for a blessing in God's eyes. 
And so God takes away his old name and confers a new one, Israel, he who has struggled with God and with man and has overcome. Now there's more to the passage, but that's enough to allow us to speak of three paintings that demonstrate three very different ways of treating this epic contest between God and man. The first is by Paul Gauguin, the contemporary and sometime friend of Vincent, and it's called Vision After the Sermon, and in parentheses, Jacob wrestling with the angel. It was done when Gauguin was living in the artist colony at pont in Brittany, just before he went to join Vincent in the south of France for a tumultuous 63 days, which ended in a quarrel with Vincent and Vincent cutting off his own ear. Gauguin was the leader of an artistic movement called synthetism, which sought to combine or synthesize the subject of a painting with the artist's feelings about the subject, conveyed through line, color, and form. It featured bold blocks of color, and there is no attempt to create the illusion of a third dimension or a realistic view of people or things. The artist, in fact, drew attention to the flat surface of a painting and expressed himself through vibrant fields of color which were often outlined in black, like a stained glass window. A number of artists, and Gauguin among them, had abandoned Paris as they grew increasingly disenchanted with the modern urban lifestyle. In the rugged coastal region of Brittany, Gauguin and others sought to return to a more primitive way of life, where old traditions were observed where people lived closer to the soil and to the sea and were not blighted by contact with the relentless noise and busyness of the city. In reality, what Gauguin sought was a world that had vanished, if it ever existed at all. Brittany was opening up to tourism and railroads and all the things he sought to escape. But it certainly was a change from the sophisticated, fast-paced life he left behind in Paris. And in his imagination, he could pretend that he was living in a bucolic paradise. And we see that reflected in his painting, Vision After the Sermon. The women you see gathered here are all dressed in the traditional peasant garb that was already beginning to fall out of fashion. They all wear the traditional coif or headscarf that was peculiar to Brittany and they all appear to be in pious reverie, envisioning the wrestling match between Jacob and the angel that has just been the subject of a sermon. The composition should be a familiar one to you from last week. You'll remember how Vincent's sower had been silhouetted against the setting sun, and in front of him a tree limb cut across the canvas, a limb that was inspired by a Japanese print. Gauguin was inspired by the same print. He had even written Vincent about using it. So here it is again, acting as a line of separation between the women on the one side and the vision they are having on the other. Gauguin's rendering of the wrestling match was probably inspired by the tradition of a very particular form of wrestling in Brittany called the Gurin, here illustrated by Paul Serousier, whom Gauguin mentored at pont and who paints in the same synthesizing style, using flat blocks of color, sharply outlined in black. It's possible that Gauguin may also have seen some of Hokusai's Japanese prints of sumo wrestlers and was inspired by them but I think the idea of the old-fashioned Breton form of wrestling, the Gurin, is more likely. In any event, Gauguin distances himself from the religious experience the women are having. He is an observer, at least in his imagination, of the vision the Breton women experience. 
He admires their ability to be mystically in touch with the spiritual world, which is something Gauguin longed for himself. Gauguin sought to find a world where people still held fast to traditions and the world of the spirit, whether that meant the women of Brittany cleaving to their Christian vision or South Sea Islanders believing in an animistic world of spirits and magic. But Gauguin could only observe, or I should say examine and imagine those worlds. Already, those traditions were changing. The so-called primitive people he lived amongst later in Tahiti had left behind their animistic beliefs long before he arrived. But Gauguin wanted to believe that such pure religious experience was alive and well, and so he painted it that way. But he was always outside of that world looking in, at best a spectator, and could only create in his imagination and then on canvas the way he felt about that world and how it looked in his mind's eye. Another artist, Eugène Delacroix, also drew inspiration from the story of Jacob and the angel. He spent several years at the end of his life struggling to realize his vision of that encounter. This is the mural he painted for a side chapel in Saint-Sulpice, a huge, very impressive church on the left bank in Paris. Here is the interior. The mural measures about 25 by 16 feet. Whereas Gauguin imagined women of Brittany in pious reverie as they envisioned the subject of a sermon they have just heard, Delacroix's painting is all action and muscular combat, at least on the part of Jacob. The angel seems to simply endure the violent onslaught of his opponent, while Jacob seems a bundle of coiled energy and headlong assault. Delacroix was the leading exponent of what came to be called the Romantic movement, which shunned the careful academic style of the classical school and favored instead images of movement and passion painted with loose brushstrokes and bold color rather than aiming for a polished, finished surface and a more muted palette, which was characteristic of art in the classical tradition. Delacroix agonized over this painting. He was never satisfied with it. The struggle of Jacob became his own personal struggle with his art, with his critics, and with a power greater than himself. He wrote of this painting in his journal on the first day of January, 1861. Painting taunts and torments me in a thousand ways. Things that seem to be the easiest to overcome present appalling, interminable difficulties. How is it then that instead of casting me down, this eternal combat lifts me up, not discouraging, but consoling me? This mural was personal for Delacroix, and he seems to identify with Jacob in that the battle he is fighting is a torment, a true agon and agony. The combat, he says, is eternal. It is never going to end. Yet his adversary, be it God or be it art, is a worthy one, so that in the end he finds himself exalted, raised up by the fight, instead of feeling cast down. Our third treatment of this subject is by Rembrandt, in 1659. Very different again from the other two. I've been unable to find any explanation for the line that runs across the top portion of the painting. It looks as though it's been torn and damaged and subsequently repaired, but I don't know the story behind it. Rembrandt had, by this time, long since left behind his early style, which was very much in the polished tradition of Caravaggio. Previously, he had chosen dramatic scenes from the Bible or from mythology and depicted the highest point of tension, shown in stark chiaroscuro 
that is, contrasting light and shadow. Now, his own very personal style has emerged with visible brushstrokes and rough surfaces. He no longer focuses on the moment of highest tension and drama. Having gone through many personal losses of loved ones and a very negative reception from the public of his new painting style, he had also recently been forced into bankruptcy so that he had to move into a much poorer quarter of Amsterdam and sell all of his possessions to pay off his debts. You would think that he would be a broken man, and yet it's in these years that Rembrandt paints some of his very greatest works, this painting among them. It's as if the bankruptcy removed a weight from him and left him free to truly be himself and pursue his own interests and style. Indeed, his image of Jacob and the angel hardly resembles a combat at all, but rather its aftermath. And it's hard not to view this autobiographically. Jacob finds rest in the arms of the angel, and the angel gazes on him with the most tender, compassionate expression imaginable. The name Jacob has been changed to Israel, and he at last can rest in the assurance that he has been blessed by God. Rembrandt knew his Bible well. He had spent a great deal of time amongst the learned rabbis in Amsterdam, quizzing them about Old Testament stories and characters. I personally have to feel that Rembrandt reveals something of his own state of mind here, a sense that resolution has been attained. After a long and at times bitter fight to become himself, both as an artist, as a man, as a child of God, he feels at peace. He has come to a resting place in God. Now, you don't have to buy my interpretation of this painting. Please feel free to interpret it as you wish. But this painting does provide a distinct contrast to the other two works. It is a much more intimate, a much more closely observed vision of the subject than the other two. Each painting is remarkable in its own way. Each shows us a different way to look at and understand the story of Jacob and his epic struggle with God. So I leave it to you to decide which one appeals to you the most, and then to ask yourself why you chose as you did. See you next week.